Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Molly Huang, Production Director of Leader Associates, and welcome to today's webinar, Investment and Finance for Indonesia's Coal to Green Transition, hosted by Leader Associates in partnership with PTPLN, Associate General, and the Power China Hotel Engineering. Before we get, before we get it started, um, a special tribute to uh, a special tribute should be paid to Huadong Engineering and Mr. Zohan for sponsoring the session so that we are able to present the content for free and to a wider range of audience. Huadong Engineering is one of the largest EPCs in China and across the globe. Later on, uh, also Mr. Zohan will be sharing their floating solar practices and opportunities siding up across Southeast Asia. To better help audience engage in the session, I have a few housekeeping items to remind you of. First of all, sound issues. Um, I think uh, if you can hear me now, you are, pro you are probably doing just fine uh, with the audio. But if at any time during the presentation you have some problems, uh, you can switch over to the telephone mode. As we can see at the bottom of the control panel, there is a chat box option. We have already kept the dialing number inside column. However, the webinar and the participant ID varies person by person. Uh, so please kindly check if, uh, the email notification and the call in with your own ID. And second of all, interactive Q&As. During the presentation, the audience microphone will be muted to avoid having uh, background noises. For questions directed to presenters, there is a Q&A box for your usage. Uh, we will go through all the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and one more important note is, uh, is that please do not add further questions or comments once the Q&A session starts as we hope to create a more comfortable environment for presenters to address the pre-asked questions instead of being interrupted by constantly popping up messages. In the meantime, our team at Leader Associates will also help out in addressing some of your questions. In the case that we do not respond to your questions promptly, uh, it means the questions have been passed over to speakers for independent address later on. So no hurry and no worries. Today's video recording and the slides will be shared with all of you by email this Friday and will be posted uh, on Green Energy Future Indonesia website as well as uh, other social media channels at the same time. Moreover, different from from traditional website uh, webinars, um, Leader Associates were also including a special one-on-one -on -one meeting system um, that was launched last uh, this Monday and will remain open till May the 25th next Monday, a week's duration. All the webinar participants have been categorized on the systems in terms of the name, job title, organization, and business scope. You can easily identify your partners that you are interested in and initiate meetings or chats via a simple click. Last few slides uh, for my presentation. Uh, we are at Leader Associates and what we do. Leader Associates is an international clean energy event organizer and the one of the largest in Southeast Asia. We are going to host our Green Energy Future Indonesia event in Jakarta on September the ACE, uh, and would like to take the opportunity to stay in, uh, stay in contact, uh, connect with uh, community peers. And everybody, can you hear me clearly? I think we might encounter some uh, audio issues right now. No problems, I think. Okay, so let's uh, continue. Uh, for all the participants today, an extra 10% discount will be given to today's audience uh, for your GFI tickets using the code INDONESIA GO GREEN. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'd like to invite our first presenter of today, Mr. Tegu Wendy Hasono, Vice President of Corporate Finance of PTPLN, to join us. Mr. Tegu, uh, can you open up your mic? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, very clear. 
Yes, and now I think it's your turn. May you do a brief introduction of yourself and the fire up your presentation? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tegu Widiarsono. Uh, I'm a vice president uh, at the Corporate Finance Division. I've been working with this company, with the company uh, for about uh, 17 years. And today, uh, I would like to present to all of you uh, with regard to the opportunity and challenges uh, with regard to the development of new uh, and renewable energy. Next. Next. Yeah. Uh, I divide uh, this presentation into three parts. Uh, first, we regard to the uh, PLN uh, uh, overview, and second, we regard to the renewable energy development target, and then uh, uh, the last section will be the challenges and opportunities. Next. Okay, next. Next, uh, this is uh, just give you an overview that PLN is 100% uh, controlled by the government. Uh, we are supervised uh, by MSUE, MEMA, uh, in terms of uh, a technical uh, regulator, and then MOF uh, uh, supervise us uh, in terms of uh, 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 provide the subsidy, provide the, uh, as the lending uh, uh, service as well, and also provide the equity injection and any other support in terms of uh, government guarantee. And then also supervised by uh, uh, BAPNAS, the National uh, Planning Agency, and also uh, uh, Ministry of Environment. Next. Yeah, uh, we are equalized with the government of Indonesia in terms of rating, uh, provided that uh, we are uh, closely uh, related uh, uh, with the government. Uh, in terms of tariff, we are fully regulated by the government, and uh, we are... Uh, uh, one of SOE that uh, provide PSO uh, to the public. Uh, that's why government provide us uh, with the uh, uh, sufficient uh, uh, subsidy. Yeah. Next. Yeah, this is to give you an idea that we control uh, more, more than 70% in terms of generation, 400% in transmission, distribution, and also retail business. Next. Yeah, this is the extensive generation network. There are uh, five big uh, islands in Indonesia. First in the uh, 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 left is uh, Sumatra. Yeah, in the center is Java Bali, yeah, where 70% of the demand is uh, 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 focused. Uh, yeah, concentrated in, in, in terms of uh, electricity system. And then Kalimantan, and then Sulawesi, and uh, uh, Papua. In terms of installed generation, currently uh, uh, we own uh, and operate uh, uh, in total uh, uh, more like uh, uh, 60 gigawatts. Next. Yeah, uh, this is the national energy policy. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, uh, target, uh, we are aiming uh, 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 to achieve uh, that uh, the renewable energy uh, will uh, consist of 23%, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of energy mix, and uh, the remaining is uh, fuel oil. This is the, the national one, yeah? not electricity, 25%, yeah? and then uh, coal uh, 36 percent and the natural gas uh, 22 percent. Pretty much aligned with the electricity sector. Next. Where we are? Yeah, up to now, uh, uh, as of 2018, uh, coal is representing uh, 62 percent. Uh, renewable energy uh, more or less uh, about 11 to 12 percent. And then the remaining is still uh, gas and fuel oil. Uh, where in 2025, we are aiming to achieve uh, a coal 54.5% uh, uh, and then uh, renewable energy 23% uh, consists of uh, uh, geothermal and then uh, hydro 
Yeah, and then uh, remaining will be compensated by gas. Yeah, about 22%. Next. This is the current uh, progress that uh, we are currently have. PLN is uh, 3.4 gigawatt, where uh, uh, still uh, uh, in construction, yeah. Uh, in the uh, blue uh, one, uh, the blue legend, yeah. And then the uh, on the IPP side, uh, 8.8 .8 gigawatt, yeah. The, the one that in construction is still, uh, uh, still uh, considerably minor, yeah. Where in the planning and also proper, uh, I mean financing is, uh, uh, I think majority is still uh, uh, on the stage, yeah. So this is the again uh, the challenges that I would like to present uh, later. Yeah. Thanks, please. Yeah. Uh, what is the the current condition uh, of? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, considering the, the 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 current situation, yeah. uh, so uh, there are some uh, uh, situation that uh, uh, I mean, as the uh, barriers uh, to develop renewable energy. For example, uh, energy price must be uh, I mean reduced, so uh, uh, will be affordable for uh, the people in Indonesia. And second. Uh, Energy distribution need to be improved, yeah, uh, in order to uh, increase uh, the electrification ratio. And then uh, the capacity of renewable energy is still uh, very low. Yeah, Indonesia uh, committed to implementing Paris Agreement, but at the same time we also have some difficulties because of uh, the energy utilization has not been yet efficient. Yeah, and then the abundant potential of renewable energy has not been utilized yet. This is also the opportunity. Yeah considering uh, the, the current condition. Next. Yeah, this is the, 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 the challenge uh, and opportunity uh, 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 provided the, uh, uh, the current situation in Indonesia. What is the opportunity? Yeah, first is potential uh, in improving electrification ratio. Yeah, as you may aware, uh, as a uh, lot, uh, End of last year, 2019, we achieved uh, 98.99 yeah, percent uh, of uh, 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 household in Indonesia already enjoyed electricity. Uh, uh, as always, the last mile will be the most difficult one. Yeah. And second, potential increasing in price of solar panel and battery. Yeah, provided that uh, the local uh, BPP, yeah, the local cost of production in certain areas, uh, especially in eastern part of Indonesia, outside Java Bali, still uh, considerably high. So uh, this is something that uh, the market should look at. Oh, this is the potential of uh, uh, quite attractive pricing for uh, solar panel and also battery uh, if we, we want to use uh, renewable energy. And then uh, small scale solar panel power plant and batteries uh, suitable for remote area. Yeah, to achieve the, the last mile, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the difficult one. And then uh, potential development of smart grid and distributed generation in remote area. Yes, indeed. Probably uh, wisely uh, to reach the, the, the outer uh, and also scattered uh, island, it is better to use uh, distributed generation uh, instead of uh, uh, using, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, interconnected system, yeah. So renewable will be one of the solution. And then feedstock for biomass uh, is still abundant uh, in some areas in Indonesia. And then also we can encourage communities involvement in the operation of biomass and biogas uh, power plant. And then what else? Uh, create uh, create a potential customers, especially the tourism industry with special tariff using renewable energy. This is also uh, one opportunity that uh, PLN is currently looking. Uh, for example, the development uh, area of, uh, let's say, Mandalika, and then uh, other uh, uh, seven new Bali that currently, uh, I mean, uh, government is aiming to to create the new destination. Yeah, and then also there are uh, the, the, there are some development that currently the industry looking for uh, green certificate, for example, 
uh, like the the the, the uh, Nike uh, and uh, some others uh, manufacturers, they already uh, have the intention to only purchase the electricity with the green certificate. So only source with renewable energy is also one one of the uh, 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 opportunity. And then application of diesel engine technology uh, with biofuel is uh, uh, quite debatable in, in yeah, especially for for uh, European uh, communities. And then challenges of renewable energy development. Well, yeah, uh, one of it is implementation of regulation concerning the, uh, we call it in Indonesia, TKDN. Sorry, uh, next slide. Yeah, TKDN or local content. Yeah, now is uh, quite high. Yeah, uh, on average, like 40%. Uh, and also uh, uh, the price is not yet competitive, so will be a challenges for the uh, developers. And then the portion of renewable energy intermittent, solar and wind is relatively still very small. Yeah. And then unreputable and inex inexperienced sponsor. This will be the, the, the challenges. As you may aware, uh, on, on, on my previous slide, uh, the construction is still very low. Yeah, eight, from 8.8, .8 only like, let's say like 20%, more or less, uh, already in construction. But the remaining 80% is still in financing and even yeah, still far away, yeah. And then also oversupply issue. Yeah, potential consequence of take or pay fines uh, to PLN from existing IPP generators. And then also some of the potential renewable energy is in the conservation area. This is especially for the uh, uh, mini hydro and also for the geothermal. Yeah. And then uh, exploration cost and funding source issue. Yeah, as you may aware, geothermal, uh, 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 drilling fund is really uh, yeah, challenging and the cost is also like six to seven million per, uh, uh, per well so it is quite expensive and indeed the, no one uh, uh, can ensure that the actual capacity will be equal or mirror, uh, and almost uh, similar with the potential capacity so very high risk and then uh, at, Tariff regulation still refers to local BPP and national BPP, which is quite challenging, especially in Java Bali. Yeah, considering that in Java Bali, uh, on average, the cost is like six cents uh, uh, per, per, per kilowatt hour. So if renewable energy need to be developed, then it should be uh, uh, at least 85% uh, from the uh, local and national BPP. Yeah, or, or uh, in other words, like cost of production to uh, uh, electricity service. So, uh, yeah, the, the, those are the, the main challenges and also the opportunities in Indonesia. Yeah, and the last one, uh, what is PLN strategy? Yeah, to, to, to combat the, the next one, to combat the Next, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, to achieve the, the re, uh, renewable energy target. Uh, first is uh, PLN will focus on the uh, development of uh, geothermal and hydro, as mentioned on the uh, 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 our uh, long-term expansion planning, and then mini hydro, and then biomass, and then solar, and second, maximizing the potential local renewable energy. Third, priority, prioritizing the development of hybrid system. Yeah. And uh, develop a smart grid and control system. Yeah. And then also use biofuel. Yeah, this, yeah, as I mentioned, still, still uh, quite uh, controversial yeah, for, for, for certain uh, 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 people. Yeah. And then uh, encourage the utilization of the development of PP rooftop. Yeah which now uh, in some areas of Jakarta is quite uh, attractive, yeah. Uh, for especially for the uh, middle up uh, income people. And then uh, government support related to funding in the form of uh, incentive and legal framework on the renewable energy uh, uh, bill. Yeah. And then uh, also development of the concept of distributed generation by involving the surrounding uh, community. And then uh, the last one will be uh, uh, adding uh, and increasing the 
the competence uh, of uh, people in Indonesia. So uh, PLN is currently uh, assessing the 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 current uh, uh, system, yeah, electricity system, like in Java Bali and even in in also Java Bali, like in Sumatra, which now is heavily uh, heavily uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, rich of uh, renewable energy. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, the most richest is uh, Sumatra. Yeah, more more hydro and also more renewable compared to other region in Indonesia. And then uh, second, we also need to prepare uh the to, to to combating the intermittent uh preparing the system to have a better uh uh in terms not only in the software but also in the hardware including the battery uh, system and most important thing uh of all is preparing the uh human resources to be ready to operate uh, i mean to adopt yeah you know Combating the the dark curve will be quite challenging if we already uh, uh, implement the, uh, and massively uh, introducing the renewable energy. But uh, all in all, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, with, with with the recent development in uh, terms of battery energy, uh, battery technology will be very helpful. Yeah, for for PLN. Next one. And then, what is PLN future? Yeah, this is the the roadmap. Uh, that uh, uh, PLN uh, will have uh, uh, sustainability in terms of uh, finance by having uh, today, uh, we still rely on coal, but now we are in the uh, transition period to prepare ourselves to be more uh, 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 improving the, the renewable energy into our portfolio. And then step by step, uh, uh, PLN will, uh, will be I mean, uh, having more renewable energy and then, of course, later by not rely on the fossil fuel, uh, the transportation costs and also by the, 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 the fuel costs, then, uh, of course, will be more uh, uh, sustainable in terms of uh, financing, given the resources is always there. I mean, uh, 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 not reliant on, 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 on the uh, imported uh, 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 fuel sources, for example. So uh, I think uh, I think this is uh, uh, all of uh, my slides. Uh, so if you have any questions, so yeah. thank you. Hi, uh, Mr. Taku, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, I, I think you have several slides continuing. I'm not sure if you want to address it or we can skip it to no, no, directly. I think, I think we can skip. Okay. We can skip. Okay, great. Um, so for everybody, uh, during the pre-registration, we have solicited several questions from your side and pick up some of the top quality ones for the presenters' consideration. And here are the top ten, uh, the, the, top, the top ten that we are mm -hmm. currently presenting. And uh, Mr. Tegu, may you kindly address them one by one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, regulation breakthrough. Uh, Look, uh, e can you make it bigger uh, to kick start the momentum? Okay, uh, addressing the first question, uh, government is, is now uh, is in the finalization stage of uh, introducing, reintroducing the fit in tariff for the renewable energy, especially for uh, geothermal. Yeah, and then uh, second, they also uh, preparing more. Uh, like uh, they call it like a uh, uh, fund, yeah, PISP fund. Uh, currently, uh, they only absorb like 50% risk, yeah. But uh, now is in the uh, consideration to absorb more than 50%, yeah, almost 100% uh, absorption. Uh, if there is any risk uh, where the, the actual capacity is less than the potential capacity when, when the developer is uh, in drilling, uh, 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 states, yeah. So this is uh, some of the the recent development uh, that encourage uh, more. Uh, 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 I mean, from the government side to to uh, encourage uh, more uh, and introducing more renewable energy into our uh, PLN energy mix. Yeah. First is reducing the the risk. Yeah, for the developers of the geothermal, 
and second of course uh, provide the the uh, quite competitive funding yeah uh, from uh, yeah there are some donors that already provide this fund uh, to PTSMI uh, one uh, SMV uh, specific mission vehicle uh, under Ministry of Finance uh, to support this uh, uh, development of uh, geothermal uh, exploration uh, geothermal development in Indonesia that's uh, with regard to the uh, uh, geothermal yeah uh, the, the one that uh, aware and uh, I, I am aware of and then also, the now uh, with regard to the uh, PV uh, and, and solar, uh, government is currently uh, discussing uh, to provide the, the incentive. Yeah, uh, with regard to the what they call it, import duty, etc., including uh, uh, not only to the imported goods but also to the local uh, content. Yeah, in order that local content should be uh, competitive. Uh, uh, can can be competitive with the imported goods. So at the end of the day, the developers or EPC contractors will be the one that uh, can uh, choose uh, which one uh, uh, to be used, uh, lo local content or uh, uh, imported goods. Yeah, because they have uh, 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 similar quality and then uh, similar benefit in terms of tax. Yeah, and import duty, etc. Yeah. Because usually when, when, when we do imported goods uh, for imported, uh, then uh, there are some uh, uh, charges imposed by the government like uh, uh, duty, uh, duty fees, and then uh, 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 fuel tax for import, and then uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, pay pay or, I mean, uh, the import uh, uh, tax, yeah. So, uh, and then with, with, with local, uh, uh, there are some discussion uh, between uh, internal uh, government to introduce more uh, incentive. Yeah, similar with the, uh, so they are in the equal position. Yeah, for solar. And then uh, second question, what is parent plan in? Uh, wait, wait, wait a second. Accomplishing 20% renewable energy will there be any proper in tariff to certain technologies of protein? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, second question is still uh, quite similar with the first one. Uh, fit, uh, fit in tariff will be uh, at the final, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, 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 final touch, yeah. Uh, presidential regulation will got to reintroduce the fit in tariff for geothermal. And then uh, we regard to the other technology like floating solar, offshore wind. Mm, I'm not yet uh, aware of, but in terms of uh, uh, battery technology, uh, currently uh, there are some discussion uh, of uh, quite big manufacturing company to 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 uh, develop uh, their own uh, factory here in Indonesia. So will be more uh, because Indonesia will be will be one of the uh, biggest supplier in terms of uh, raw material of uh, battery, nickel, etc. And then also uh, will be the big market as well uh, for the next five years. I mean, uh, uh, considering uh, the one that I just mentioned on my slide that uh, one uh, of the factor to develop renewable energy by using uh, uh, battery technology. Yeah. And then there, there are some uh, tech incentive uh, for, 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 for this one. Like uh, if you may aware last year, government introducing the, the incentive for the electric vehicle. Yeah, uh, tax incentive. So will be more uh, competitive for, for the people to use uh, uh, electric vehicle. And then, um, Policy of renewable energy to make uh, investor interested in PLN and public still can get best price uh, for energy. Yeah, this is again uh, always uh, 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 two sets of coins, like uh, uh, like uh, two sets of coin, right? We we have to we we get we we cannot choose. Yeah, if 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 we get the uh, price, then uh, of course uh, uh, we need to have uh, we need to have affordable price, and then. Uh, at the same time, uh, for the investor, we should reduce the risk. Yeah. So uh, this is something that uh, uh, currently investors should consider. 
that uh, when they dealing uh, to invest in Indonesia, I think uh, uh, one of the bigger uh, one of the biggest risk is uh, land acquisition and permit. So it is better to have a, a very good cooperation with the local partner. Uh, it's up to you. I mean, uh, like local SOE and also other other uh, other partner that really know where uh, how to deal with the land acquisition and 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 permit in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, I know that uh, currently uh, one of subsidiary PLN is uh, developing with uh, the offshore partner, uh, floating solar panel with a very competitive price. I think uh, one of the biggest floating solar panel in in Southeast Asia. And I think one of the lowest price in, in terms of uh, PV solar panel, a uh, floating solar panel in, in Indonesia up to date, until today, yeah, uh, five point something, yeah, uh, per kilowatt hour. So I think uh, you should you should you should know very well uh, yeah, Indonesian market, uh, Indonesian low uh, land acquisition and 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 permit. For example, uh, the one that still uh, now is in the final discussion. I mean, uh, uh, final development uh, of uh, uh, floating solar panel, why they can provide very, very good price because of the land acquisition already done, permit uh, almost done, and then mostly uh, 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 can over to to the local partner, which is capable enough to deal with that, with, with those issues. And then uh, opportunities and constraints for foreign uh, developer to participate in the transition in the Philippine. The, 60 for investment restriction. Okay, <clears throat> in Indonesia we don't we don't have any such kind of uh, restriction. But uh, again, uh, understand the local market is the key. Yeah, so you should have uh, the people or the partner that really understand well Indonesia, uh, Indonesian law, land acquisition permit, etc. And they can solve everything. And then uh, 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 the, the, the foreign partners can be focused on the technology, for example, and then bring the, the most competitive financing. So uh, uh, that's, I think uh, that is the, the key that should be addressed, yeah. And uh, for, uh, if you want to success in, 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 in the uh, development uh, of, I mean, the, the private sector in Indonesia. And then, uh, what is being done by PLN to encourage local bank to provide competitive non recourse project financing? Yeah, to be honest, uh, Indonesian bank is not yet really active into the project finance. Uh, if you ask me why, uh, because uh, the local bank tend to avoid something that, uh, yeah, their appetite is not yet uh, uh, advance. I mean, to 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 enter into the business that quite risky, like project funds, because they are not uh, covered uh, by the parent company, right? Only rely on the assessment of the project and also uh, assessment of the counterpart. I mean, I mean the one that purchase the product that uh, uh, provided by the project funds. Uh, so uh, what uh, currently done by PLN? Okay. PLN uh, uh, have uh, 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 introduced to the to the local bank. I mean, uh, encourage the SOE bank and encourage uh, some of the uh, uh, national private banks to participate in some of uh, IPV project. And then, uh, given they understand uh, already the PLN credit, so uh, we have a regular meeting with uh, with the with the local banks. Uh, so. Uh, on the last five years, we invited uh, mostly all of the private bank to come participate into our financing, local financing. Uh, so uh, at the same time, we, we, we introduce more local financing or local currency into our portfolio. But at the same time, they can understand well how PLN operate and, and how important PLN as the single uptaker and how we can deal uh, with the government in terms of uh, if something happened to PLN. Because sometimes there's still uh, uh, a question about uh, can PLN uh, pay, and then uh, what if uh, what if uh, 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 I mean uh, PLN have uh, financial difficulty and etc. By knowing more uh, PLN credit, then they understand that uh, PLN is uh, also at this very close position 
yeah, compared to any other SOE uh, in, in, in front of the government of Indonesia. That's the, the, the one. Uh, if, you, uh, if you see uh, recent, recent development, uh, uh, quite a view, a local bank already participate into the uh, PF, yeah. Next. Uh, rules involving in the next three years, any plan of PLN, relaxing local content. Okay, with regard to the local content, uh, it is not uh, basically domain of PLN. Basically, PLN as uh, uh, SOE uh, need to comply with the, the, uh, the, the, the regulation yeah, issued by the industrial uh, Ministry of Industry, so we should comply with that because if not, then uh, there are some uh, penalties, uh, charges to PLN. So as a, a good corporate citizen, of course, PLN will, will follow that regulation. Uh, but uh, in case by case, uh, the developers can apply and can submit the, 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 the request uh, to get the exemption, I think. Yeah, as you may aware, uh, any country, I, I think, uh, should should, I mean, protect uh, their own interest, right? Uh, while uh, also enjoying uh, more uh, foreign direct investment uh, come uh, to their country. And then, okay, very, very, very good point. Uh, why the government tender is not announced in a large, a large pool? It will be more interesting for investors. Yeah. Your idea is something that uh, PLN is uh, now considering. We learn a lot from uh, uh, other countries like Taiwan, yeah, when they tender a very large project and then uh, by playing with the ec uh, economic of scale, then uh, we, can, we can have very competitive uh, pricing. So this is something that uh, PLN currently uh, also uh, 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 considering yeah, to have uh, the, the quite same strategy with, with the other countries. Instead of uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, a scattered project and uh, 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 with dealing with many projects but with a small scale, yeah, will be economically uh, not viable, yeah, for the developer as well. And then, will PLN go ahead to develop any new coal fire for pen? Yes, yes, you may be aware that uh, uh, on the last uh, three years uh, we experiencing. Uh, uh, drop in demand, so uh, PLN will evaluate uh, its uh, uh, strategy. As you may aware, that uh, yeah, uh, 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 there will be no uh, big uh, coal power plant uh, in Java Bali using coal. Yeah, that's the 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 the, the, the MEMA, uh, uh policy. Yeah, with regard to the uh, coal uh, technology technology, and then on the other part of Indonesia as well. Uh, uh, PLN is uh, also uh, following uh, uh, national energy policy, so uh, uh, we are uh, in uh, a step that uh, need to consider renewable energy as the first uh, uh, priority. For example, like Sumatra, uh, a lot of lot of renewable energy development there, and also outside of Java, like in eastern part of Indonesia. Uh, uh, so currently PLN also develop uh, yeah, uh, a solar panel and also uh, battery technology yeah, to be installed in certain part, uh, certain very remote villages in, in, in Papua and also Maluku to reach uh, elect uh, uh, electrification ratio. Yeah. And land is one of the biggest costs, yes, and the others to acquire indeed. That's PLN has scheme that will make this project interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, that uh, you need to have a local partner that uh, we have very good uh, understanding about the local contacts, uh, not only land acquisition, but also permit. Yeah, this is the biggest challenge. But uh, uh, during the last uh, five years, uh, there are some bureaucratic things already cut uh, under the current administration. So we do believe that uh, land acquisition, as long as uh, 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 for the public usage, will be more uh, uh, faster in terms of execution uh, compared to 
uh, the last decade. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, improvement in terms of legal context. Uh, not uh, not uh, to mention uh, yet uh, the the current law, which is uh, with regard to the omnibus law. Yeah, that the uh, the higher the higher regulation can uh, override the, the lower regulation. Yeah, this is something something that we should appreciate. Yeah, of the current uh, government uh, uh, focus on to improve uh, the investment climate in Indonesia. And then, uh, yeah, you should have very very good local partner. Yeah, peel and subsidiary is one one of the best example, right? <laughs> and then, uh, how does the COVID nineteen situation affected Indonesian? Indonesia plan for energy transition or any impact to the current renewable energy planning of PLN? Yeah. Uh, in Java Bali, uh, uh, the current development of power plan, uh, like the floating, will uh, considerably uh, still uh, small, yeah, compared to the uh, big uh, power plan that already in operation. So it should be fine. Uh, and then outside Java Bali will be. A uh, very good opportunity, yeah, uh, considering the local PPP or the local cost of production is still high. And then uh, also by introducing renewable energy, you also uh, will enjoy a, 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 a quite, quite huge price difference if we, we have uh, developed in, in, in Java Bali. So I think. Uh, uh, in eastern part of Indonesia, where the economic growth is still considerably uh, high compared to Java, even they consume less yeah, in, in terms of uh, size, yeah. but still uh, the development of renewable energy in eastern part of Indonesia is still uh, uh, attractive enough for the developers. Uh, again, you need to have a very good understanding about the local context. That's why uh, it, is, it is best choice if you can have a good local partner, a good local person to understand the, 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 the local situation, permit and land acquisition. And uh, yeah, it is very good if we can have a land acquisition done by, by the government or, or, or any, any national uh, agency, for example, like, like uh, uh, the same concept in Toll Road. But uh, we don't know yet with regard to this for the power sector. Yeah. As long as uh, this risk can, of course, definitely we reduce the price. PLN uh, again at the end of the day, uh, the people in Indonesia will enjoy more green energy with more affordable price. Of course, PLN uh, is most welcome with regard to that idea. I think I'm covering all. Any more questions? Yes, uh, two more questions from our side. Uh, Mr. Tegu, are you ready? <laughs> so this yes. will be. Um, so first, of, uh, first question from uh, my side. Um, um, so um, the Indonesian government, uh, so-called uh, MEMR, um, always left the, the impression to the public that they always talk big but do little. Uh, during the past year, there are a few uh, good signs uh, from MEMR regulation uh, 12, 13, and uh, 16, I think, uh, toward uh, rooftop Solar projects in Indonesia, the government has reduced some capacity charge and uh, optimized the overall um, permitting process. But this year, I think it was uh, in last week, that the MEMR has decided to reduce the rooftop projects installation from the government funded solar rooftop installation projects from 800 units to 144 units. And for solar powered street lamp from 40,000 to 26,000 due to the budget cut. Uh, do you think it's a um, uh, emergency response uh, um, as a result of the COVID-19 or it's another uh, you know, um, re re retreat of the government toward the green energy? No, I don't think, I don't think that uh, that is a retreat of the government from the renewable energy even the MOF uh, and also cross ministerial level like MEMR uh, and, and, and village ministry also uh, already asked PLN to increase more renewable energy. Yeah, to have the solar panel and then battery uh, technology, etc. 
like even the equity injection cannot be used anymore for coal power plant. It should be focused on the renewable energy. So government is really concerned about the, the, the renewable energy development in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah as I mentioned, uh, even equity injection should be focused on the renewable energy, cannot be used, uh, no longer be used for, for, for any other project like, yeah, heavily coal, for example. And uh, does PLN have any plan to uh, be a more open-minded? Um, hello? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, does PLN have any plan toward an open market? For example, if we take uh, Vietnam as an example, the EVN, the electricity of Vietnam, was originally a highly vertically integrated utility. However, in recent days, they opened uh, a direct power purchase agreement to the private sector where they uh, uh, allow the corporate renewable buyers to sign contracts uh, with um, IPPs directly without use the uh, PL, uh, sorry without use the EVN grid. So, uh, do, do you think that in the future days we will also see the same action conducted by PLN? Uh, very good question. But uh, uh, in our view. You should, if if you if you uh, if if we consider the our constitution, uh, 1945, uh, it is very clear mentioned uh, Article 33, with regard to that uh, very strategic uh, industry need to be owned and controlled by the government, and uh, privatization is very sensitive issue in Indonesia, and we don't think that uh, will be workable in the short and medium term. Uh, due to the, yeah, the, the very sensitive uh, uh, issue for the people in Indonesia if we introducing the privatization. For example, uh, there were low number 20, 2002, it was canceled last time due to this issue. And second, low number 30, 2009, some article also canceled by the constitutional court uh, due to this issue as well. So, uh, it should be owned and controlled by the government and, 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 and PLN is the representation of the government. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, may you kindly open up your uh, control panel. There is a Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, yes, and I think there are uh, still five questions in the open panel, uh, but I think we only have time for one question. Um, would it be possible for you to answer the question uh, raised by uh, Miss or Mr. Uh, Ling Tembu Bolong. Uh, foreign developers has constrained to participate in the re-projects, notably for projects below 10 megawatt. It is only uh, 49% and with the latest tender, 30% must be shared to mandatory partners. Um, also, uh, we learned from our last webinar that the presidential regulation from the uh, president, of course, uh, will provide a special incentive program for projects under 10 megawatts. So in that context, which business model would you recommend for the international stakeholders to join in for smaller projects or remain to pursue for large projects? Yeah. Uh, very good question and very challenging question as well. Yeah, so uh, the idea of uh, uh, development of uh, a bigger, than, uh, sorry, uh, less than 10 megawatts, the tender should be done by uh, our unit, business unit, and usually dealing with the local developers. So, uh, and mainly mini hydro, mainly mini hydro. And they enjoy a, a very competitive uh, IRR. I mean, very good IRR. Uh, and then, uh, so in terms of return, no question about that. And then uh, uh, this will be a very, very good opportunity for uh, the uh, offshore uh, investors. Yeah. But uh, the design of uh, uh, I mean, uh, less than 10 megawatt, of course, focus on the local local uh, developers. Uh, dealing with bigger than 10 megawatt, the tender will be done by uh, head office and uh, using the direct selection, right? Uh, not direct appointment, yeah, direct selection. And in, it usually takes uh, time uh, because uh, they 
need to do a, a, a feasibility study and etc where the bankability issue of the project is a, a, a question so again uh, 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 for PLN itself, uh, as long as the, the foreign uh, uh, investor is uh, have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, competitive uh, in terms of financing, and then competitive in terms of uh, technology. So uh, you need to address one more uh, one more uh, factors that you should focus on, which is the feasibility study of the location if uh, bigger than 10 megawatt uh, and then uh, less than 10 megawatt uh, usually uh, because of big, uh, uh, low risk then uh, again the uh, question is back to you uh, if you are okay to do uh, uh, 10 project with, with, with 10 megawatt instead of uh, 100 megawatt by, by, by one project then again uh, uh, it is a, a game of uh, uh, diversification project, right? Diversification for uh, our portfolio uh, 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 project. So, yeah, if you ask me as, as, as a personal, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't have any 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 definite answer. But back to to the investor, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, considering their investor, uh, I mean, investment appetite and also risk appetite as well. How? how the level they understand about the Indonesian context and, and, and with the with the proposed location, with the proposed project. Back back again to that to that question. And Thank then, you so much Mr. Tegu, okay. for your kind address. This is a very informative uh, presentation and the QA. And because we have two more panelists lining up, so uh, if you don't mind, may I uh, switch the Presenter to our next one, Mr. Daniel Malo from Sosia General. Thank you, thank you, Molly, uh, for the opportunity yeah. today to, to discuss um, the transition from coal to green uh, in Indonesia, and um, I'm, I will be talking about it from the perspective of a provider of capital, uh, being a, an energy banker, and, and we are involved in a number of energy projects in Indonesia across asset classes, really, uh, gas, uh, geothermal, hydro, and solar. Uh, so I'm, I'm proposing to do a few things, and, and I'm looking at the questions that have been addressed ahead of time. Some of the questions were about risks. What are the risks and the concerns by investors? So I will try to address that. Um, um, how transactions or financing uh, differ between uh, thermal generation, coal versus green. Um, how Indonesia has access to sources of financing. Um, as well as the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on getting uh, projects uh, done <clears throat> in the current environment. And then finally, if we have time, I will uh, maybe show a, a, a few case studies uh, to put all this into more concrete perspective uh, of recent transactions that have been done in Indonesia in the sector and, and what makes them a little bit unique. And, and, and finally, uh, maybe touch on a couple trends that we see elsewhere in Asia uh, in the renewable energy space um, and, and, and discuss whether they, they may become relevant uh, to Indonesia, uh, if that's okay. Um, how much time do we have, Molly? Uh, well, let, let's get started. So let's start very, very quick. Yes, in uh, terms Daniel, yeah. uh, you have around 20 minutes plus 10 minutes Q&A. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So let's start with a very quick introduction on who we are on slide two. Um, so we are a, a European bank. Uh, we've been in Asia for a long time, uh, over 150 years. Uh, this is a little bit the footprint of what we do uh, in, in Asia. So as you can see, we're active in most markets, uh, from India to Australia to Japan. Um, uh, and, and we have done renewable energy projects in, in, in all of those jurisdictions, but today we will discuss more specifically Indonesia, uh, where we've been very active and we've actually been named Indonesia Project Finance Bank of the Year in 2015 and in 2017, reflecting that level of activity. On the next page, uh, you will see uh, what our institution um, uh, its commitment uh, to renewables and the climate change uh, topic are. Can we switch to the next slide, please? 
Um, so you, you will see here what, how we position ourselves as an institution uh, with respect to climate. Um, and I, I would point on maybe three or four items. Uh, the the, the third, uh, first item is uh, we're very much supporting the energy transition as an institution. Uh, our, our goal is to uh, gradually reduce uh, our portfolio of fossil fuels, um, increase substantially renewables, we have announced not several years ago that we will no longer finance uh, the coal industry, um, coal-fired power stations, coal mining and transportation related to coal. Uh, secondly, uh, the bank has committed um, to raise at least 120 billion euros uh, by 2023 uh, for the uh, energy transition. Uh, so this will be a combination of helping clients raise green capital and on investing directly in renewable energy projects. Um, and the third point I would make here, I would make here is that um, we consider natural gas uh, to be part of the energy transition. Uh, we think gas is a transition fuel. Uh, the footprint, um, uh, the, the, the CO2 footprint of gas is substantially lower than, than coal. Um, it is a base load source of energy and we think it will be part, it, it, it has to play a part in the energy transition. So that, that's how we look at the sector from a policy standpoint. We also try to be innovative uh, and be at the forefront of te technology. So things like uh, floating wind, for example, floating solar that uh, uh, Mr. Zuhan will talk about uh, on, on the next presentation also, battery storage are all areas that we have experience in. And then the next slide is really to, um, uh, to, to, to show you a little bit more concretely what we have been doing in Indonesia more specifically, and it is a little bit small, I'm sorry for that, but, but to point out a, a few transactions that are relevant to the discussion today is on, on, the, on the bottom right side, the, the three transactions that are boxed, that are in a box, you will see there uh, two hydro uh, power stations uh, that we financed. One is called Hassan in Sumatra, it's 39 megawatts. The other one is called Asahan One, also in Sumatra, that's 180 megawatt power station, hydro power station. We have also done a few years ago a, a large geothermal project called Sarula, uh, 320 megawatt. It is probably one of the, it was the largest at the time we've done the transaction, it probably still is or close to. And then uh, towards the left hand side on, 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 the, on the top top row of those boxes, you will see a more recent transaction called Java One, uh, which is an LNG uh, receiving terminal, a floating LNG receiving terminal coupled to um, uh, 1700 megawatts of new gas fire generation in the Java market. Um, as well as a transaction with PLN uh, called Grati, uh, which is also a combined cycle uh, gas-fired power station. So as you can see, we have experience across asset classes uh, in Indonesia. We are currently in the process of finalizing two transactions. One is uh, in the solar space and, and was, one is in the hydro space. So that's just a quick introduction on who we are. Uh, on, on the next slide, I wanted to uh, really discuss very briefly, and I'm not going to dwell on this because Pak Tegu already talked about the energy mix in, in, in Indonesia, but, um, but maybe two things I would like to point out um, about the landscape in Indonesia. The first one is, um, you know, it is a country that um, uh, offers opportunities and, and has very strong underlying fundamentals. If we take away COVID-19 for a moment, um, uh, you know, Indonesia was growing quite fast. Uh, GDP growth rates, uh, four and a half, five, five and a half percent. Uh, demand for power uh, higher, uh, outstripping uh, GDP growth rates. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, still uh, a certain level of untapped power demand. Uh, there's still areas in Indonesia where access to electricity is not available, so that's demand that's not served today. Uh, so if we put all that together, uh, it is clearly a, a, um, a country that should offer opportunities. Um, and, and clearly COVID-19 may uh, put a, a, a slightly different light on this, and I will come back to that in a little bit. But still, uh, we see the fundamentals as being quite positive uh, for renewable energy investment in Indonesia. The last thing on my topic also is that uh, uh, the geography of Indonesia is quite unique. I mean, Paktigu mentioned uh, uh, a lot of islands. I think there are 15,000 or so islands in, in Indonesia. Um, 
uh, PLN is not going to serve them all, uh, just from a logistical standpoint. Uh, so I think there will be a number of applications in, in this country in particular where uh, distributed uh, generation solutions in the form of mini grids or micro grids using solar, using maybe biomass, uh, will, will, will find a place uh, and, and meet some of that untapped demand. So that's on the fundamentals. Um, I will skip the middle section that Pak Tegu discussed already, which is the, 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 uh, the supply mix currently. Uh, and, and then uh, the only comment I would make still on this page is that, you know, not all renewables are created equal. Um, uh, Indonesia is blessed with tremendous hydro and geothermal potential. Um, among the best in the world. Um, those are renewable energy sources. Um, you know, when, when we, and, and they have their merits, in particular geothermal is a baseload, uh, a baseload renewable energy source. Uh, so that is extremely valuable uh, to have uh, a, a, an energy that is fully renewable and that can provide capacity factors as high as 95 or 96 or 97 percent. It's very unique. Uh, it does require an upfront investment cost, um, but it is a very valuable uh, source of energy. Hydro has also a, a tremendous potential in, in Indonesia. Um, so I think uh, at the end of the day, it, it is all about a diversified energy mix uh, and, 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 and being able to combine uh, the right sources uh, of, of energy uh, to, uh, to accompany Indonesia and its energy transition. Moving to the next slide, I'm going to touch a little bit on what, um, what are the investment considerations and, and the risk factors. And, and as an investor, um, for those kind of projects, we are looking essentially at three major things. Um, one is the regulatory framework. Um, and, you know, it can take a variety of, of iterations. It can be feed-in tariffs. It can be PPAs. It can be auctions. It can be renewable portfolio standards. At the end of the day, the, the, the exact nature of the regulatory framework is, 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 um, is up for interpretation. And, and I'm not saying the, the, the investors will have a very strong preference for one versus the other. But what they will be seeking is a stable... Uh, permanent uh, regulatory environment, um, a clear energy policy, a uh, clearly articulated energy policy by the government um, to, to provide uh, uh, that comfort uh, to investors uh, that the, the, the country, the regulator, the, uh, um, uh, the energy uh, authorities are, are committed uh, to this energy transition and want it to happen. I think Pak Tegu mentioned Taiwan in, in his talk. I think Taiwan is a good example of, of how that can translate into success and into the ability to attract investors from all over the world to invest in renewables. Uh, Taiwan recently embarked, uh, as recently as two years ago, embarked on a major um, shift towards renewable energy. Um, it, there was a clear signal from the governmental authorities that they wanted that to happen. They wanted to phase out nuclear, they wanted to phase out coal, and they wanted to promote renewables. And as a result of that framework, um, they have been able to attract investors from all over the world uh, to develop both offshore wind and, and solar projects. So, so it's an example uh, to, to illustrate how that matters to investors. Related to the regulatory framework, I think what investors are looking for is revenue certainty uh, and, and quality, uh, quality uh, revenue agreements, quality PPAs. And on that front, Indonesia has a history uh, of, of providing uh, some of those uh, PPAs uh, with, with PMN. So that's the first, uh, first segment, is, is the quality of the regulatory framework. The second uh, key consideration is really um, strong risk allocation and, and, and de-risking the projects, which means uh, a solid construction risk mitigation package, um, which means uh, partnerships potentially uh, to optimize risk mitigation. There's a number of, of projects that are done in partnership in, in partnerships uh, with government, with, um, I'm sorry, with Indonesian companies like PJB at times or Pertamina, um, that is helpful. Uh, that is helpful from an investor standpoint to have the opportunity to partner up with a major Indonesian energy company and develop a project jointly. Um, uh, and then the third element, the third key element is, is uh, uh, for, for a successful investment really, is an efficient financing. 
um, you need capital, um, you need uh, to, to, to be able to optimize your, your capital, uh, your capital structure, your cost of capital, especially if it's in a bid situation where you're competing against others. Uh, so, so clearly having an efficient financing is helpful uh, to, to be in a strong position. You need a stable capital structure. Those projects are long-term projects. They have economic lives of 20, 25, sometimes more years. Um, so you need a, a, a stable capital structure to reflect the long-term nature of those assets. And I will come a little bit in a, uh, about the current disruptions uh, in, in the financing markets. So we've, have, we've have really shaken um, uh, the financing markets for the past uh, two or three months now. I'm hoping they're starting to abate. We see a little bit of, of early signals of them starting to abate, but nevertheless, um, uh, they are a consideration at the moment. Um, so the next slide is really quickly illustrating why do sponsors um, uh, use project finance for those kind of assets and, and those are kind of the key considerations. Um, uh, the fact that it's legally non-recourse, um, uh, it reduces the corporate financing burden, you finance at the project level rather than on the balance sheet of the developer, you can achieve things like higher leverage or longer tenure. Um, uh, and, and, and oftentimes when you're in a situation with partners, uh, you know, some of the partners may have different priorities, different objectives, different credit profile. So it allows for a unified approach uh, to the project. Um, moving to the next page is just an illustration uh, on those, uh, of those risk allocation, of that risk allocation. If you can move to the next page, please. It's just an illustration. Uh, Thank you. Um, on, on how this all comes together, I was talking about the quality of the contractual framework on the on the on, on the um, on the construction side, on the offtake side via the PPA, uh, on the operational side via the NONM operations and maintenance agreement, uh, on the supply side if it is a, a gas fired power plant, um, and, and and really trying to achieve an alignment of interest across the value chain uh, to to to, uh, to to preserve um, the integrity of the project. Uh, in the interest of time, let's move to page nine, the next page, and, and talk a little bit more about um, the key risks. Uh, there was a couple of questions that came from the audience and what are the key concerns, the key risks uh, for investors. I've tried to summarize them here. Um, so there's five or six of them, construction risk, clearly. Uh, that is the uh, point in time in the life of a project where the risk factors are highest. Um, so the ability to build, to build on time, uh, not to incur cost overruns, um, all of those things need to be mitigated. There's a variety of ways to do that uh, through strong construction contracts, through contingencies in the budget, um, through liquidated damages by, by contractors, sometimes through completion guarantees, but there's a variety of ways to, 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 to mitigate that risk, but that is clearly a key risk. It varies across the, across the range of projects. Some projects are more complex than others, uh, but it is a risk in, in every project. Um, operating risk. Uh, the ability to operate the project over time, to maintain it, uh, to, to make sure it continues to perform, to uh, minimize degradation. Um, um, supply risk, which is not a risk, um, or supply or resource risk, I should say. Um, so for renewables, it, it's really the availability of the resource, um, forecasting the availability, the availability of wind, of, 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 of the sun, of hydrology. Um, for gas-fired projects, it's, it's more around certainty of access to gas, uh, infrastructure uh, to get the gas to the project, et cetera. Um, market risk, you know, typically we want to know who will buy the power. In Indonesia, there's a good model for that with PLN. I mentioned that earlier. And then financial risk, uh, which is really uh, managing risks that we don't want the project to be exposed to. Uh, interest rate risks, you know, again, those are long-term horizons. Rates will move. Uh, interest rates will move over, over 5, 10, 15 years. There's no question about it. Uh, we don't necessarily want the projects to be exposed uh, and to those kind of risks, so they need to be mitigated. Foreign exchange risk, you may be buying equipment from Japan, from Europe, from the United States in different currency, those risks need to be mitigated. And as well, having um, liquidity in the structure, reserve accounts, you know, unforeseen things do happen, so having some level of liquidity in, in, in the structure is important. Um, 
Um, I might move two slides down, Molly, to page 11. Thank you. To now talk about um, funding sources. Um, you know, one of the questions, or a couple of the questions that came back um, from the audience were, um, what's the best way to finance, local versus international, who are the providers of capital for those kind of projects? So I try to summarize here who the main uh, providers of capital typically are, and, and these four or five categories. Um, uh, starting on the left, it's the export credit agencies. Um, moving towards the middle, it's the multilaterals. So those are institutions like the Asian Development Bank or the IFC or, or alike. Um, moving a little bit more towards the right, it's the, the capital markets, the bond market, and, and at the very end, uh, on the right, it's the banks. And actually, the banks should probably be split into two columns, which would be the local banks that Pak Tegu uh, touched on a little bit earlier, and the international banks. So they all have advantages and, 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 and drawbacks, um, and, and they, offer, they offer different things. Um, um, they, have, uh, they all have value, um, and, and, and they can be combined in some situations. Uh, you don't need some of, the, some of them in other situations. I think at the end of the day, what, what is driving a little bit the capital structure on how to finance a project efficiently is two things. A, the size, you know, the big the project, um, the more capital sources you may need to combine. Um, it's very different to finance a uh, $75 million solar project or a Java One, which costs $1.8 billion. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit in the case studies. So size is one driver. Uh, the bigger the investment, the more diverse the capital structure might need to be and, and, and the more varied the funding sources might be. Uh, the, second, um, the, the, the second driver really in, in, in choosing the right uh, source of funding is often uh, preferences, uh, sponsor preferences, uh, the developer's preference. Some developers are very accustomed to work with export credit agencies, for example. So if I take uh, uh, Indonesia has enjoyed a lot of investment from uh, Japanese investors um, over the years. They very much are accustomed to working with their export credit agencies, JBIC and Nexi. Um, I think it's a framework that they know well. <clears throat> it is something that gives them comfort, uh, and, and they like to, do, to use that. Uh, other sponsors may be less focused on that, and, and then maybe a little bit more focused in uh, efficiency, getting mm -hmm. things done a little bit faster. Um, and, and they may they may turn towards the banks. So very, very quickly, what, what are the key features of those funding sources? The export credit agencies, you know, they can provide large numbers. Um, they're very much uh, driven by um, sourcing, procurement, uh, or a presence of a, a sponsor or an investor from that particular country. So they have criteria that you need to meet to attract them. Um, uh, the multilaterals, um, they are also a valuable source of capital. They can do relatively long maturities. Um, um, uh, they work oftentimes hand in hand with banks, so they can also be a valuable source of capital. Uh, the, the capital markets, maybe spend a half a minute on the capital markets, which is a new, a relatively newer source of financing uh, for, for, for Indonesia, for, for energy in Indonesia. I think they have benefits. Um, the, the benefits are deep liquidity. Uh, you can raise large amounts of money uh, in that sector. Uh, they like long maturity. Um, uh, usually the longer the better. Uh, they actually like that. Um, uh, they struggle with a few things. A, a, they're very sensitive to market conditions. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 recently, the markets that have repriced the fastest uh, have been the capital markets, uh, especially on the public side of the capital markets. Very quickly, they would reprice, uh, and, and, and you see the cost of financing move very rapidly. Uh, secondly, they're less experienced uh, for construction risk. Um, they tend to like invest to invest in operating assets, uh, so they're not necessarily a good fit at times for greenfield projects. And then thirdly, they're very much driven by credit ratings and that they're the only market really that are driven by credit markets. So, so they do need, um, uh, it would require access to, um, to a credit rating to tap that market. Having said that, they can be valuable 
for certain asset classes. If we look at the recent past in Indonesia, there have been two coal-fired plants that have been refinanced, operating assets that have been refinanced in the capital markets. Um, uh, quite efficiently uh, with long-term uh, financing and it is a little bit of a reflection of uh, liquidity in, in some of those other categories that I mentioned, the export credit agencies, the multilaterals and the banks. Liquidity for coal assets has dried up substantially. There's very little liquidity still available in those categories. Having said that, the capital markets are available. And then finally, the banks. Um, so the banks uh, are very active, uh, typically, uh, for, for, those, um, for those kind of assets. I do agree with Pak Tegu that the international banks are, are, are more active, way more active than the local banks in Indonesia. Um, that's not necessarily the case in other markets. I mean, we see the local market, and we see the local banks being very active in, in countries like the Philippines or Thailand, for example. But in Indonesia, I would agree that um, uh, the local banks have not focused that much on project finance yet, uh, and, and it's largely a, an international bank marketplace. Um, so that's on the, on the capital sources. Um, on the next page, I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19, which is on everybody's minds. Um, and, and to me, uh, there's three categories here. Um, the short-term consideration and the longer-term considerations, and, and then more specifically, the impact on financing sources. So short-term. Uh, I think short term, um, the, the question is really for projects that are either under construction at the moment or that we're about to start construction. So we're almost shovel ready, uh, had their PPAs, had their permits, had their financing pretty much done and, and, and we started, start, we're, we're planning to start construction. I think there what we'll see is um, a few things. Um, uh, potential disruptions on the equipment supply side. Uh, and, and we've seen that in our portfolio here in Asia. We've had other projects in other parts of Asia that were under construction and have faced some delays in getting uh, solar panels, in getting inverters, in getting transformers or other electrical equipment. So that, that, that is a consideration. I, I think it's likely to, to normalize a little bit as, as a lot of that equipment is sourced from China and, and China is, is normalizing to a large extent, but still it, it is a risk factor that has been exacerbated. And, and along with it is really the ability to build, the ability to send workers to the site. You know, we have uh, Indonesia is in quasi lockdown, Malaysia is in lockdown, India is in lockdown. The ability to mobilize construction crews is, is complicated. Uh, and, and that is likely to, to lead to delays uh, in, in achieving commercial operation dates, which again could cause problems vis-a-vis -vis, uh, PPAs that may have sunset dates, uh, dates by which you have to be in service, otherwise you risk losing your PPA, so those kind of things happen. So what will we need in the short term? I think uh, in the short term we will have probably the sources of capital will be a lot more focused on those risks. And they will be looking for more contingencies, more liquidity available for those unforeseen events. And secondly, there will be a desire for flexibility. Uh, flexibility with the off-takers, flexibility with the uh, provider of permits. You know, uh, some things will be outside of the control of the developer if, if major disruptions occur and, and having commercial counterparties that show a, a, a good level of flexibility will be appreciated. So that is the short-term impact in my view. Longer term, uh, I'm a little bit more worried about the longer term impact for two reasons. One is, um, is um, how will demand for power recover? Um, and, 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 uh, and we have seen in, in a number of those countries demand coming down substantially, 20, 25%. I mean, Patigu, you probably have a good sense for Indonesia, but I've seen some numbers for other countries where as a result of the lockdowns, as a result of the, the, the massive drop in economic activity, demand for power has, has, um, has fallen dramatically here in Asia, but also in the United States, in Europe, uh, globally. Now, the question is how quickly will it come back? Um, and, 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 and I'm hopeful that in Asia, it will actually come back more rapidly uh, than it will in other parts of the world. And to some extent, we are starting to see some of those signals in places like China, uh, South Korea, um, that, have, um, that have exited lockdowns several weeks ago already. Uh, and I'm hoping that this, this will be a pattern, um, a pattern uh, 
that will, uh, will remain true in other parts of Asia. Having said that, you know, PLN might be reconsider reconsidering its investment strategy. Uh, PLN might be looking at different uh, forecasts now or different assumptions for future demand for power as a result of the strategy, uh, as a result of the, um, of, of the pandemic, sorry. And then the second thing that, um, that COVID-19 could, uh, as a result of that, um, uh, lead to is delays. Delays in tenders for new projects, delays in awarding new projects. So this could set the industry back a little bit. Um, and, and a number of those processes that um, in investors, developers were hoping to see happen uh, over the second half of this year uh, for projects next year and the year after may, may slip a little bit. Um, so PLN will be much closer than I am, but th this is a little bit what I'm, uh, I'm what I'm worried about in terms of longer term considerations. And thirdly, what's the impact of, on, on capital sources, on financing sources? Uh, clearly, the markets have been highly disrupted. And as I was saying earlier, uh, that's been particularly the case in the more liquid public markets, less so in, in the project finance markets. Those markets are usually much slower uh, to adjust, but they've been disrupted nevertheless. What are we seeing though? We're seeing a few things. The first thing that we're seeing is the availability of capital remains quite high uh, for renewable energy projects. Um, so that is good news uh, for the energy transition. Uh, it's good news for renewables. Um, I think that is probably the one pocket in, in, in the investment spectrum where availability of capital remains highest. Uh, it's more difficult for commodity-based projects, it's more difficult for oil and gas, um, it's more difficult clearly for unloved asset classes like coal, uh, but for, uh, for renewables, even in this disrupted market, uh, capital has remained largely available, and we are seeing that. I was referring earlier to two projects that we're in the process of financing now, um, and, and the banks are continuing to move forward. Um, we're doing things in India, we're doing things in Taiwan, in renewables at the moment, and we see the market continue to move forward. So that is good news. The cost of financing has gone up, yes. Um, in, in the, at the moment, it has gone up. It is more expensive today to raise debt financing than it was three months ago for a renewable energy projects. No, no question about it. Is that dramatic, though? I would say probably not. Um, I think there's a lot more value in getting a project financed and, and constructed now, even though you may have to pay up a bit more for your financing. Um, you can always refinance in a, in a couple of years from now in a more normalized market. And, and extract more value out of the project. But I think there is still value in, in, in developing, in, in being, a, being able to produce in, in short order rather than being delayed one, two or three years. Um, and then as I said, the financing structures go, going forward are likely to include a renewed focus on things like contingencies, cost overruns, delay risk, et cetera, and the quality of the underlying sponsor to, to go through this more difficult environment. I think I'm, I'm running out of time. So very, very quickly, uh, Molly, if I can move to page 15, please. Two more. One more. Thank you. So, so really to illustrate that in, in less than a minute, I wanted to show you three transactions. One is Java 1. Um, so 1,700 megawatts of, of gas-fired power in, in the Java system, coupled with a floating regas facility. That transaction got done uh, about a year, just over a year ago. Uh, it's halfway through construction. Um, it's a good example of the partnerships that I mentioned. Uh, so this is a, a partnership between Portamina, um, Marubeni, and Sojits. Um, so very strong sponsors, uh, very experienced in the sector, and this good partnership between an international sponsors on the one hand and local sponsors. Um, the, the financing is a combination of several sources. So we have the Asian Development Bank here. We have JBIC. This is a typo, actually, uh, which is the Japanese Export Credit Agency, as, as, as well as a group of banks, including ourselves. So that is a good example of a larger transaction, including multiple capital sources. On the next page, um, uh, we have uh, Sarula, um, a geothermal project in Sumatra, 320 megawatts. Uh, also a large project, 1.6 billion in, in capital costs. Um, 
also a diverse, uh, very diverse funding structure. You have the Asian Development Bank again, you have um, JBIC, uh, the Japanese ECA, as well as banks and a group of banks, including ourselves. Again, here the sponsors are Itochu and Kyushu Electric from Japan. So it comes back to that angle that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, sponsor preference. Uh, Japanese sponsors tend to like to work with their Japanese ECAs, and we've seen that both in Java 1 and here in Sarula. And then finally, uh, the next page is a hydro power project um, called Asahan One. Uh, thank you. That's 180 megawatts in Sumatra. Uh, this is uh, no ECAs here, no export credit agencies, but it's a combination of the, uh, the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, as well as a group of banks, including ourselves. So those are three examples to, to put this in perspective a, a little bit. And then my very final word will be on page 19 and 20, uh, and, and, and possibly actually as, an, as a lead-in to uh, Zuhan's presentation. What do we see happen elsewhere in Asia? And I wanted to point out two things uh, that are interesting. The first one is on page 19. Uh, it, it is that second tombstone in the first column, so it's hard to see, but it is a floating solar project uh, in Taiwan um, uh, with Marubeni from Japan as a lead investor. It's 180 megawatts um, floating solar. Um, I think that is exciting because it's an asset class that is likely to grow very rapidly in the region. There are opportunities in North Asia, there are opportunities in Indonesia, there are opportunities across ASEAN. Um, uh, so that is an exciting asset class for which I would argue that Asia is leading the way. I think I, I see more activity in this asset class in this part of the world today than in Europe or in the Americas. So that is an exciting development and it, and it will uh, make its way to Indonesia. It's already starting. We are currently working on a 140 megawatt floating solar project in Sumatra that we're hoping um, it's going to take maybe a little bit longer to, 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 to get the financing done, but we're still hoping to close that sometime in the second half of this year. So that is an exciting development. The second exciting development in the region is on the next page, um, um, which is in, in that box um, on the upper left corner, which is the uh, really the advent, the advent of offshore wind as an asset class in Asia. Uh, that is also exciting. Um, two years ago, uh, there was probably nothing in offshore wind in Asia. If I take away China, which is a more unique market, uh, but two, two, two years ago, there were zero megawatts in Asia of offshore wind outside of, of China. Today, there is over 1,500 megawatts in Taiwan that are under construction or, 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 um, or, or starting to operate. Uh, the first project in Japan just reached financial close. It's that second one again with Marubini. It's a 140 megawatt project in Akita Prefecture. Um, we see opportunities, more opportunities in Japan, in South Korea, maybe in India, in Vietnam, maybe in Australia, and, and who knows, maybe one day in Indonesia. So that is also exciting to see a, a new asset class develop very quickly uh, across the region. So with that, Molly, I'll, I'll stop here. I think I run a little bit over. Sorry for that. Hi, Daniel, you are both uh, welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, I think we still have some time for uh, nine or 10 questions. So we're not going to answer all the questions solicited, uh, solicited by the uh, audience. For the first slide, I would suggest uh, number two and uh, number three. And for the next slide, we'll have number two, number three, number four, and then the floor will be turned to audience Q&A. We have three remaining in the open panel. Would that be okay? Okay, so number two and number three on this slide, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the best type of financing for green power plant future uh, plan? Uh, what's the main difference and the uh, uh, key characteristics between local banks and foreign banks? Yeah. So the best type of financing for green uh, power plants, uh, I think the good news is that uh, you have options because uh, uh, what I was saying about size, you know, so the bigger it is, the more financing sources you need. If I look at the average size of, of a renewable energy project, um, it's probably um, a few hundred millions uh, max. Sabrula is maybe a bit of an outlier, uh, but if I look at a, a, an average size hydropower station, a 50 to 100 megawatt hydropower station, if I look at a 30 or 50 megawatt solar plant, um, if I look at a 
70 or 100 megawatt wind farms. Uh, those sizes are relatively manageable and can be done in a single market. So, 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 uh, and that is, is helpful from an efficiency standpoint. Uh, and clearly, uh, the banks uh, have a high level of appetite uh, for, for that asset class. So you will find optimal conditions probably with banks, sometimes in combination with multilaterals. Uh, so that's what I think is, is, is the best approach. What's the main difference of long terms for renewables versus conventional? Uh, and local versus uh, foreign bank. Um, so I think um, I, I think that the main differences between conventional and and renewable, in my mind, is a uh, the depth of the availability of capital. Um, you know, I was talking earlier about coal. The availability of capital for coal today has shrunk dramatically. Um, None of the multilaterals, none of the international banks. Last year, the Singaporean banks exited that sector. So the ability now to raise large amounts for that asset class uh, uh, is very difficult um, because the number of market participants has shrunk quite a bit. Um, on the on, on the flip side, the availability of capital for renewables is highest. The whole market um, is focused on the asset class. So that certainly allows for optimizing terms, uh, having more competition, driving the cost of financing down. Um, local versus foreign. I mean, as I indicated during the presentation in Indonesia, we don't see the local banks be very active yet in project finance. Why that is, um, it's probably because, you know, as an asset class, it demands specific skills on the credit side, on the technical side, and the banks just have not invested in, in that space. Um, in a number of markets, we would be very open uh, to team up uh, with uh, with local banks. It's always good, actually, to have a, a local presence. So, for example, in Taiwan, I come back to Taiwan. Uh, it's very it's very customary that a bank group would be comprised of both uh, locals and internationals. But in Indonesia, we're not quite there. Maybe over time, we'll see a bit more developments. Can you move to the next page, Molly, please? All right, and here you wanted to me to cover which ones? Uh, yes, uh, number two, three, and four. Okay, so the, uh, the worries of the banks, uh, I think I covered that a little bit. So the key risk factors uh, are really what I mentioned earlier, regulatory framework, quality of the revenue agreement, uh, that, is, uh, that is paramount uh, for a long-term investment, and then adequately uh, mitigating uh, construction risk and operating risk. Uh, those are probably the, 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 the top. Uh, the top items. How do I grade Indonesia's market access for international capital? I think it's high. Uh, I think it is, um, you know, Indonesia is a big market. I mean, it's, it's a market that provides a lot of opportunities. So, um, so it, it's, not, it, it's a market that cannot be ignored. If you are an energy, an energy banker in this part of the world, you will spend some time in Indonesia because it, it is a recurring source of opportunity. Uh, secondly, Indonesia is investment grade. Um, the sovereign credit rating is investment grade. So that opens up new avenues uh, of, of capital that makes it a bit more attractive also to the bond market that I was talking about. So I think the, available, the, the access for international capital is quite high and, and across, um, across, um, across sources of funding. And then number four, what are your suggestions for other lenders or investors on supporting 25% renewable energy um, target uh, by 20 for the next 10 years? Okay, so how can we accelerate? I think that that is a good question. Uh, so how can we accelerate um, uh, the development of renewables um, in Indonesia? So clearly I was I started by saying that the fundamentals are conducive. Um, the demand is probably there even post COVID-19. So, so, so what could be done better, what could be a breakthrough. Um, uh, to me, um, and, 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 and maybe it's a little debate we can have with Pak Tegu, but um, um, a few things. You know, I mean, uh, it, it comes back really to um, the government sending a strong signal that they want this to happen. So, for example, prior to, prior to prioritizing, uh, given a priority uh, for renewable tenders um, in, in the tendering process, fast tracking. Um, tenders for renewable energy, uh, making them quicker, more efficient, um, that could be very valuable. Uh, secondly, um, the whole issue around land acquisition is, is always relatively complex in Indonesia. So are there ways to solve that problem? 
uh, well, one way is probably to uh, to go on the water uh, rather than on land. Um, so 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 that goes towards maybe a faster um, eclosion of floating solar solutions uh, to 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 minimize those land acquisition acquisition issues. Secondly, I mean, we've seen other countries, I, I go to India, for example, for inspiration. You know, India has built those solar parks uh, where they, the government takes care uh, of the land uh, and, and, and infrastructure and transmission access. And, and, and that's been a way, a great way to fast track renewables because it bypasses those issues around land acquisition. So to me, this is, this is probably uh, the areas that, that are worth considering uh, from, from the regulator standpoint, for PLN standpoint, is higher degree of priority uh, for renewable tenders, finding ways to fast track those processes and, and, um, and uh, um, streamlining, uh, streamlining land acquisition uh, processes by having dedicated sites for renewables and, 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 and lastly, uh, by uh, spearheading the, the, solar, the floating solar development. Yes, okay. and uh, if you don't mind, may you also kindly answer the last one, would be the new lesson ideas or unusual um, business approach that PLN can learn and uh, implement from your side? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, it's probably along the same lines, right? I think um, PLN is a valued, um, a valued entity uh, to, to make this happen. Uh, I think they're clearly central in, in setting policy. Um, uh, so, so I think I, I would again encourage to, to find ways to, uh, to optimize tendering process uh, for renewables. Um, I think capital will, capital will be available. Uh, I, I can commit to that, that uh, capital for renewables will be available even in disrupted times. Uh, so we would be very open to, to, to continue to work with PLN on, on uh, fast track processes uh, for the developing uh, renewables across Indonesia. Okay. And uh, may you kindly open up your uh, open panel uh, in the Q and A box, and uh, I think we will try to uh, address the top three questions first from an anonymous uh, attendee, uh, Daniel. Uh, what is the minimum project value or project size for a solar PV project to be um, project financed? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, the, the issue is not so much, um, the, the, the core of the issue is uh, uh, financing a 10 megawatt project or a 75 megawatt project is probably going to cost substantially the same uh, from a due diligence standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from a technical due diligence standpoint. Uh, so it's more to find a way to amortize transaction costs. I mean, I, I was referring to the project that we're doing at the moment. It is uh, 22 megawatts. Um, uh, so it's relatively small in size. Um, uh, can, can you do uh, much smaller than that? It, it becomes to be costly. The smaller you go, the more costly it is. But I would say uh, um, uh, 25 megawatts and up uh, is probably um, is, is probably uh, the size for a single financing. And the second one uh, would be um, from Lane um, again. And the questions uh, would be the uh, model PPA for PLN as well as I think the collaboration model between uh, PLN, its uh, subsidiary, and the foreign stakeholders. Um, okay, the last one. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, uh, so. Transfer to a <clears throat> to a mandatory partner. I, I think that is really primarily an equity consideration. Um, the fact that you have to to you have a mandatory requirement to bring in a, a partner, uh, I think from a, from a lender standpoint, having a, a local uh, local partner, or uh, I was referring to Asahan, for example, PJB is in the equity there. That that is not necessarily a negative. Um, on the specifics of the of the PPA for mini hydro. Um, uh, I would have to defer on that. Um, um, I don't think I can address that right now at the moment. Okay, then last one, uh, Mr. David Goulier from NG, and asking about the comparison between Indonesia and other uh, ASEAN countries in terms of renewable energy development. May you kindly address? Yeah, yeah, and I think, uh, I think David, um, 
uh, potential is there, um, and, and you, you, you've invested in geothermal, so you know it firsthand. Um, so the potential is there. I think it comes back to a little bit to what I was trying to address uh, in, the, in the previous two questions is, um, is there a way to, to fast track tendering processes? Um, uh, is there a way to, um, uh, to streamline land acquisition um, processes? Those are typically the things that are cumbersome a little bit and, and tend to uh, uh, tend to create um, tend, tend to slow down really the development of the of the industry. And then I go back again to what we see in other uh, other markets like India or. Taiwan, um, where, where they've been able to, to really fast track. So I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from some of the other other markets in the region uh, to that respect. Yes. Uh, thank you for, so much, Daniel, for the very informative presentation. And as mentioned earlier by PLN, that the local bank is um, not uh, very active in terms of the renewable finance, has putting international capital at a very important role or even at the center of this whole uh, project development. And we look forward to SG as well as other international financiers support to the market. And if you don't mind, uh, may I switch the um, uh, presenter to uh, Mr. Zohan? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello, Molly. Yes. So can you see my uh, sharing? Yes, um, already. OK. Oh, sorry. I think I. Sorry, one moment. OK, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Johan from Power China Huatong. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here to introduce a little bit what we have done for for solar project in Southeast Asia and to 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 share some understandings. Uh, uh, as introduced, I'm um, Johan in charge of uh, uh, our business in Southeast Asia, more specifically uh, uh, Asia Pacific. So, but we focus more in these ten countries for now. And we have a uh, business in most of the countries here. So um, we are a company from China, right, located in Hangzhou, and we have uh, a lot of branches in, in the worldwide. Uh, since this um, this afternoon, this meeting is more about uh, solar and uh, renewable energies. So uh, I just use one slide to introduce a little bit what we do. So until now, um, for solar uh, projects. We have about uh, 1,000 megawatt EPC project in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, mostly in uh, Vietnam, in Malaysia, uh, potentially in the Philippines and Indonesia, of course. And uh, uh, we have in the worldwide for EPC is about 3,000 megawatt, including Middle East, uh, South America, and uh, Europe. So um, uh, for floating solar, uh, we have about 100 megawatt uh, pipeline. Actually, uh, 100 already completed. Uh, so more uh, in our pipeline in uh, many countries in South Asia. Actually, I will introduce a little bit later. So until now in, in this region, uh, uh, with our performance for wind, onshore and offshore wind uh, in several countries here, uh, we are trying to be actually the, the, the biggest EPC company. For, for renewable energies, uh, including solar and the wind, right? That's uh, that's a, uh, a little bit about our background. So uh, we go to Indonesia. Um, it actually it's very easy to find out that uh, Indonesia has very big potential for solar power plants, and this is a, a map from World Bank institution. So uh, this estimates that in total. Uh, the, the, the potential capacity of solar can be about 500 gigawatt, which is immense. And as Mr. Deku uh, introduced earlier, uh, we can see that uh, we, there is already some encouraging pipeline from PIM to, to push more projects and more development of solar or other renewable energies. So, um, 
that's why we are here today and uh, we uh, really hope that we can have more chance to to uh, to help develop more projects uh, in, in Indonesia, which will be very, very huge potentials. So uh, next, I will uh, give some cases for what kind of projects we have done, especially for solar, uh, to, to give you some understanding of uh, uh, what, what kind of projects we can do in Indonesia, especially uh, as the topic of my introduction is uh, solar at dams. So mostly connecting to, to water. Um, so uh, first of all, I just introduced uh, two projects we have uh, done for floating solar, uh, which is quite new and uh, developing very, very fast now. Uh, this is a project in, in China we completed uh, about three years ago. It's, uh, it was 25 megawatt. At that time, 25 megawatt was quite big, right? Uh, so the, this project is next to uh, an irrigation dam. So you can see that there's water everywhere. So because it's a, it's a kind of a reservoir. And uh, uh, some, a little bit more about technical uh, parameters to have an understanding for you, for you is the water depth of this project about 30 meters. So water variation is about four meters and the wind speed is about 30 meters per second. So this, um, uh, this is, I, I mentioned this because these, uh, these parameters are quite important for floating solar to be feasible, I mean, technically. Uh, the next one is in uh, Vietnam. We just completed last year. It's about 50 megawatt. Um, so it's invested by, by EVN subsidiary and uh, financed by ADB. So um, uh, I think many of, you know that in Vietnam what happened last year, it, uh, so a lot of projects were completed within six to one year. So this project is one of them. So uh, this project, floating solar, is in the reservoir of a hydropower, which can be a good reference for, for many locations in Indonesia because uh, uh, as Daniel introduced, uh, in Indonesia, a lot of hydropower potentials or existing. So uh, I think a lot of locations can be used for, for floating solar. Uh, uh, so for this project, for this reservoir, the water depth is about 30 meters as well and water variation, uh, almost same, almost same. So uh, uh, this is just for reference, right? Uh, at least for, for, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, conditions, floating solar is uh, uh, probably doable. So I will go a little bit further for this technical uh, identifications. Uh, so we are also uh, um, help, helping uh, develop more floating solars in this region, I mean Southeast Asia countries. Uh, we are doing uh, some projects in Laos, which is quite big as well. Uh, and we, uh, we are also helping a lot for the um, uh, projects actually in, in the Laguna Lake of the Philippines, I think many of you know as well, uh, because uh, a lot of investors are trying to uh, develop big uh, floating solar in this lake in the Philippines, uh, which is supposed to be one gigawatt in the future. So for, for that project, for that lake, actually this is where the dam, right? This is a natural lake. So what depth is about four meters and the variation is about one to two meters. So uh, for floating solar, it's, it's not really difficult and it's very, I mean, quite conditions to, to build this kind of floating solar. Uh, in Indonesia, actually, uh, uh, several one of you have also uh, mentioned already that uh, uh, some investors are already developing big uh, floating solar in Indonesia and it's already in advanced uh, stage. So we are still talking to the investor and we uh, we hope that we can have chance to 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 work them with you uh, with the PIN and with the investor together to 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 build the project. So just for reference, this uh, project with water variation up to 50 meters. So this is quite uh, high uh, variation uh, for floating solar, and the water depth is three meters to 94 meters, which is quite deep right, for because this is a, a reservoir by hydropower. So um, the variation and the depth are both uh, quite challenging for, for 
development of a floating solar. So uh, actually, uh, as mentioned, floating solar is getting very popular in most of uh, Southeast Asia countries uh, because I, I, I know that in most of the countries, people are trying to develop. But uh, here, I just want to, to give some attention and uh, because we made some cases, um, uh, the de development was not very successful for floating solar because it's still uh, different from ground, ground solar, right? Um, Technically, uh, solar farms are not very difficult compared to thermal or hydro or, or anything else, right? Even wind. But uh, still, uh, we can hear news about bad cases of, uh, of these projects. Uh, these pictures just show some bad cases uh, we heard or we, we, we saw. Uh, so the first one you can see, uh, this is a very typical, uh, um, technical issue for floating is that when they build this project, there's water, but maybe in some month or one year, it gets totally dry. So uh, all the floaters, you can see they, they, they are just on the ground. So the, all the panels are kind of destroyed, many pieces. So it, then the project, I, I don't think it will be a su successful project. And uh, on the right side, this is a, a project, a potential project in Vietnam. So uh, some developers already uh, did a lot of works to, to get permits, to, 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 to do some uh, early stage designs. Uh, but uh, when we, we, we went to site, uh, we saw that uh, in the location where they're supposed to, to put, uh, put the, 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 the panels is already dry. I mean, just a little water left. So uh, eventually we, we, we don't think this project is a really good choice for developing a floating solar. So uh, what I mean here is uh, if we are going to do something for floating, then we really need to be careful and do some due diligence uh, technically uh, to, to make sure this is a really good location for that. Uh, so uh, we really uh, propose that the uh, developers can take good consideration when of the following items when they decide to 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 push forward uh, floating solar, including water depth, water variation, uh, wind speed. Actually, wind speed is also important because we, if you try to check out the news. In Japan, they got typhoon and uh, the whole project was destroyed on fire as well. And wave and flow speed are also important, especially for hydro power reservoir. Uh, water quality is also one of the um, important factor because uh, with bad quality, the corrosion of uh, uh, the corrosion may happen and uh, it may affect the reliability of the project. So. This is just some uh, reminds uh, for, for developers here. So, uh, and of course, well, one of the most important factor is the anchoring system design. So, um, because I, I met a lot of developers who think the design of a solar or a, the construction of a solar project is very easy, you know, everyone can do, but uh, at least for floating solar, try to get a good anchoring system design before you start to construct. Uh, it's not just a simple connection, then you can let it float, right? Uh, this may give you quite a lot of risk when it's in operation and when it meets like strong wind. So anchoring system design is very important. Uh, a slight, um, so uh, I, I mentioned a little bit for floating solar, but what I want to also um, give you some tips is that uh, aside from floating, uh, we can also do, for example, powering for some water area, even for the uh, dam site, I mean, uh, the reservoir site, more specifically. For example, this picture shows a project, uh, um, uh, a solar project in China, which is not floating. Uh, even you can see uh, maybe it looks like floating, but it's not floating, right? It's on the water, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, installed uh, 
on the piles. So uh, this uh, the mega, uh, it's about 140 megawatt, and uh, we used uh, the ship to do piling. You can see that the foundation is a pile, right? So it's not floating. And uh, another project we we just uh, completed last year the Baudian project in in Vietnam, which is uh, until now the biggest uh, solar farm in Southeast Asia, uh, with 500 megawatt uh, capacity. Uh, so, uh, so the owner is Bigrim and Srinko from Vietnam, Bigrim from Thailand. So we did the whole EPC uh, within one, one year. This project is interesting. You can see that uh, the whole project is uh, next to a reservoir, which is a, an irrigation reservoir with, uh, with dam control. So uh, for now, it's, uh, it's, uh, from the picture, you can see it's, it's not really uh, in the water. But uh, uh, actually, in in about uh, during about four to five months, the whole project will be flooded uh, because of the dam adjust, uh, adjustment. So you can see the blue blue one is the flooding. From September, the, the the water starts to to rise and flood the the whole project. And uh, from uh, December, all the whole project will be flooded. So the flood will go away uh, uh, from February to March next year. So about 45 months, it will be flooded. So, uh, but we can still do, do a solar farm in this kind of uh, scenario. Uh, you can see that this is during dry season, I mean dry land when the flood is not there. So we use just a very standard uh, powering machine to, to do powering, but uh, Definitely the pile here is quite long. Uh, to be mentioned, the, the longest pile here is about 12 meters um, to, 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 according to the site geology and the, the flooding uh, water level control. And uh, for the four months I mentioned, uh, when it's flooded, we have two pile again uh, on the water. So, so we may need a ship to do piling. So this picture shows uh, installation on water. So we need people to do works uh, on water during flooding season, I mean flooding month. And this is a, a whole completion after flood, after uh, actually COD um, uh, June last year. So uh, I, I mentioned this project to, to, uh, to say that both uh, floating and piling uh, somehow uh, can be can be considered when you have a location at water site, right? Maybe dam site or, or a lake site or reservoir site. So they're both, uh, uh, they can be both doable or maybe uh, one of them can be doable. So how to, uh, I just have some simple uh, uh, thoughts about how to, uh, judge which one is uh, uh, doable, which one is better. So uh, from these factors, we can have a very simple judgment like water depth, water variation, and uh, and water geology. So uh, it's easy to be, uh, it's easy to understand that uh, the water depth and the uh, underground and water geology are more sensitive for for piling. I mean the piling type, not the floating type, because uh, if you do piling, definitely the, the underwater geology is important. And the water depth is very important because if it's too deep, then you don't have, you cannot find any pile which can fit, right? It's not long enough. We cannot do 20 or 30 meters pile. And the water variation is more sensitive to, to floating solar because it, it makes more technical issue for the floating uh, technology. Uh, otherwise, we also need to consider, as I already introduced, uh, the wave height and the water flow, which are also some factors to, to judge preliminary uh, which kind of technology we should use for this location. Uh, just uh, so uh, one more slide about the comparison of the floating or powering. So uh, from environment side, I think what we judge is both of them are, are slightly negative to, to impact the environment, uh, as long as the construction 
uh, during the construction, we have very careful HSC control. Uh, for the efficient side, uh, the floating solar uh, should have higher efficiency and then uh, ground solar. So uh, it depends on different conditions, but usually it can be 5 to 10% higher. And powering, uh, it, it, it's a little bit higher than ground solar. So uh, for efficient side, floating can be much more advantageous. Uh, from cost side, as well, floating may cost uh, higher than, than powering, but uh, with um, um, reducing the cost, uh, reducing from the floaters, uh, because of the, dif the biggest difference is from the floaters. Um, the cost is also getting down uh, more and more. So uh, I think in the near future, a floating solar can be as competitive as powering or as ground solar. At that time, I think definitely more floating solar will be welcomed by, by uh, investors or even uh, PI, PI in Indonesia or EVN Vietnam. So they will uh, need more floating. Uh, but until now, it's difficult to compare LCOE side because it uh, depends how much the land costs because uh, in some countries, the land is quite expensive and for water side, it's, it's free. So uh, the land cost is quite important input for the LCOE. Uh, calculation. So, uh, in case in case some of you are trying to develop some floating or some solar projects in uh, at what site as mentioned, better uh, at the beginning you do some preliminary identification of all these uh, uh, hydrologies and the geologies of flooding level to make first judgment and uh, to see if it's really technically doable or financially doable. Then at the second step, you bet uh, deep a little bit more to see technically which, which um, kind of technology you can apply and uh, uh, how cost effective it can be. And of course, uh, the last step is to, to have uh, ALCOE running to decide uh, which, which, which uh, layout, which, uh, which uh, scheme of the uh, like a uh, powering or uh, 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 floating to go. I think uh, this is uh, uh, still needed. Even the flow, uh, the solar project is simple, but better with uh, we 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 still follow the regular uh, judgment process for for our project seriously. So um so this is a uh, very simple uh, in sharing from our side. So uh, we really hope that uh, all the investors. Uh, can have a safe and successful solar farm on water because it's still it's still um, special compared to ground solar, and uh, we are ready to 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 help from early stage uh, identification uh, period until whole EPC support. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tohan. Yes, and uh, uh, for the next procedure, uh, we'd like to enter the Q&A session. And may you kindly open up the uh, uh, Q&A box and answer the uh, three questions um, uh, directed to you uh, from Mr. Muhammad Nasif. Uh, in the meantime, I will switch the slides to mine uh, and introduce some of the solicited questions uh, that we collected from the audience before. Okay. Yes, so the first question would be, what might be the uh, working scope for uh, Huarong Engineering in carrying out the floating solar projects? Is it a full EPC, including floater and anchoring system, or uh, only the electrical part? Yeah, usually we, we can uh, untake the whole uh, EPC works, including everything, because uh, we, we try to uh, deliver the whole uh, service to from beginning to the end until COD until TOC. Right? So the whole service we can we can handle. Yes, and uh, what's the site maximum wind speed uh, where floating PV can be replaced? Sorry, can be placed. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's difficult for now for me to 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 say a figure. A confirmative figure because uh, uh, it's not only about wind speed and also for for example we need to consider of typhoon, a uh, possible typhoon. 
but uh, definitely uh, with the wind speed uh, going up, then the cost of the anchoring system may arise uh, accordingly. So, uh, so the for most of cases we did like the 30 meters, uh, even 40, even higher. It's still doable technically, but when the wind is too too strong, then uh, we don't think that maybe the financially it's it's going to be a problem. So um, uh, uh, we can say uh, for most of cases until now it's uh, it's technically doable, but. Uh, we may need to consider more about financial side. Yes, and uh, one last question from uh, uh, Ricky Ridwan. Um, there is a big challenge of floating solar in Indonesia. The regulations that water utilities use only um, used for three activities, water sports, uh, fish ponds, and agriculture irrigation. What are the prospects of floating solar in Indonesia if this condition occurs? You mean, uh, you mean uh, for these three purposes, can we do floating solar or? Um, I think uh, that's the- Oh, you mean other, other purpose of the reservoir? You mean uh, we still can do this project? Um, I, I think uh, what he mentioned is uh, for the governments, they only uh, they, they have set a certain restriction regarding the, um, um, the use of water bodies and uh -huh. And what what would you uh, what you uh, what potential do you find in these three uh, water bodies? So uh, in, uh, technically uh, speaking, uh, we uh, floating solar can be uh, suitable for for all these cases with different purpose for the reservoir uh, because we definitely we cannot uh, but uh, we cannot cover the whole surface of the reservoir because. Uh, it may cause issues in that case. So usually we, we cover just partial right, surface of the reservoir. So technically it can uh, fit for most of the purposes. For example, the dummy project we developed it's for a uh, fishery, uh, fishery uh, purpose. Uh, it's hydropower reservoir, but they, they also put fish inside, right? Far, uh, fish farming. Uh, for, for shrimp, it's the same thing. So, from this side, uh, technically, it's no, not really a big issue. Mm -hmm. Well understood. Uh, and uh, for Ricky, uh, what I would suggest is to use our one-on-one -on -one meeting system that I will uh, introduce a little bit more later on. And uh, for the moment, uh, I think we should uh, switch our eyes on the screen. Um, some of the questions uh, raised by the audience before. Um, I think we will not uh, run all these questions, but uh, question number two, number four, and uh, number five. Uh, Mr. Zohan, can you please come Two four here? five. So two four number five. two, competitiveness of floating PV among the other other frontier technologies. You mean ground or powering, right? But solar, right? Not uh, compared to wind or something. So uh, for floating solar LCOE site, until now. Um, as I mentioned, it, um, if in case we consider land out, right, we don't take land into consideration because in different countries, land can be with different costs a lot. Uh, so until now, the um, for floating, uh, the EPC cost or uh, capex is quite higher than ground solar, right? But the, the um, uh, efficiency is higher as well. Uh, but uh, in conclusion, until now, uh, it's still uh, higher. LCOE side, it's still higher than ground solar or piling. Um, but in case, in case uh, the land, for example, is very expensive in in some countries, for example, in Indonesia, in some countries, to for for ground solar, then uh, it can be uh, lower for floating solar in Indonesia. Right, uh, because uh, the land also is a big import in the in the uh, capex side, right? So, so generally speaking, uh, FPV is still higher than others. That's why some countries, for example, um, in Vietnam or in China, they have um, uh, for for feeding tariff, they they have higher uh, price compared to ground solar, because they want to promote uh, floating solar to 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 be pro, uh, processed. Yes, so, uh, okay, so go to na question number four. What are the requirements for insurance? So usually the, the insurance is quite same 
and until now, uh, my understanding is quite same for for uh, floating solar PV as uh, ground solar PV. Uh, some owners, for example, they they are worried about the floaters, right? Because uh, it's on the water. So uh, in case the floaters have some big issue, then the whole project will be will be in, in a catastrophe. So uh, so I as far as I know, the floater some uh, reputable float manufacturers can buy insurance for their floaters, which can give extra coverance. Uh, so this is a special insurance for the floaters and for the project, but uh, it's, uh, it's with extra cost. But usually uh, most of projects, they, they, they didn't really have a, uh, additional insurance for that because it's quite costly. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and one more question from my side. Um, so uh, we know that every year uh, that uh, PLN, PDPLN, the national power company, uh, spend heavily on subsidizing the uh, electricity price so that all the poor households can have access to electricity. Uh, when would you think would be a turning point for floating solar projects to emerge as a popular option for the Indonesia market? Competing I with think, um, from market projects. Uh, because in Indonesia, uh, until now, uh, solar is not uh, a, a very uh, major uh, energy source, right? But uh, actually, the uh, in my understanding, because I have stayed in Indonesia for several years, um, I know uh, several actually um, attendees already uh, give out the, the problems we have to develop solar or floating solar. Uh, the major uh, problems are more about uh, okay limitation for imported products like uh, panels, and uh, the, the the conflict with uh, the control of the uh, PPA fitting tariff, right? So uh, these big uh, conflicts may give a lot of difficult to to develop solar ground solar projects. Then, as mentioned, uh, floating solar for floating solar. Uh, the LCOE is usually higher, right? So it's more difficult to promote floating solar than ground solar, more, right? In case uh, PIN has same uh, feeding tariffs for both, right? So at the same level, floating solar is more difficult to, 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 to get uh, uh, promoted. So uh, your question is when you think uh, it's, uh, it's more interesting uh, but uh, the good thing is, as mentioned, in Indonesia, they have a lot of dams, they have a lot of reservoirs. And for ground solar, uh, it's very quite difficult to solve land issue in, in like Java Island, right? So uh, in combination of all these considerations, floating solar can, can be at the uh, uh, same timing, maybe with ground solar, because uh, LCO is higher, but not that higher. So, as you can see, the first floating solar is uh, about 200 megawatt, which is really big and uh, eventually feasible. So uh, I think it will be together with uh, ground solar, like in many other countries. Uh, but better if PRN can consider to have extra uh, compensation for a floating solar, then definitely it will help a lot. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sohan. This is also what we expect to see more solar and the floating solar projects coming up uh, in Indonesia. And uh, thank you again for uh, your detailed explanation on the technological side of the projects and, and uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you so much okay. for all the- Thank you, Molly. You're welcome, yeah. Staying, us, staying with us for the two hour session. And uh, before we- and the whole webinar, I'd like, to take, I'd like to take just two more slides in introducing our one-on-one -on -one meeting system that is very unique in the whole Southeast Asia energy domain. Um, so uh, as you can see from the, sorry, give me just one minute. As you can see from the screen that uh, different from traditional webinars, we have also included an exclusive one-on-one -on -one meeting system to facilitate business leads accumulation amid the corona pandemic. And I believe that all of you have received emails from my colleague, Rachel, to provide you with the login link and the password. 
The 101 meeting system was launched this Monday and will remain open till May the 25th, next Monday. So it's a week's duration. Um, all the webinar participants have been categorized uh, on the system in terms of their name, job title, organization, and the business scope. So you can easily identify partners that you are interested in and initiate meetings or chats by a single click. And up to date, uh, for big giants like PLN, PJB, PJB Investing, also the Investment Promotion Center of Indonesia are also on the system. So please feel free to join and uh, do some networking activities. And uh, last but not least, uh, for all the slides, like the video clipping and uh, the uh, presentation slides will be shared with all of you by the end of this week. It will be on Friday. So I hope you all look forward to it and enjoy this webinar very much. Thank you so much. And that's, that's the end of our webinar.